The stealth genre in gaming is one I find that's not as appreciated as it should be. One might even say underrated. While there are good stealth games on the market, things like Origami, Mark of the Ninja, Styx, Master of Shadows, etc., there are very few that reach mainstream success. Ask your average gamer to list their favorite stealth game, or even just a stealth game they are aware exists, and your typical answer would probably probably be something along the Assassin's Creed line of games, or maybe even Metal Gear Solid. At least, that was the case until late 2012, when the world was introduced to the amazing world of Dishonored. But you know what you should be introduced to? The subscribe button! Cheesy YouTuber stuff aside, I would genuinely appreciate it if you did just take one measly second to click on the subscribe button. I am hopefully trying to hit part by the end of the year and it would mean the world to me if you just took that one little bit of a second. All right, now back to the video. Developed by Arcane Studios, developers of a couple of cult classics back in the early to mid 2000s, Dishonored released on October 9th, 2012 to critical and commercial success, selling over 400,000 copies in its opening month, made even more impressive by the fact it had to compete with Pokemon Black and White. White 2, which had come out only a week earlier. Dishonored had done something rarely seen from the stealth genre of games. It managed to break through to a large mainstream audience. It's not difficult to see why either. The city of Dunwall is vast and interesting, with plenty of lore, NPCs, and cool powers to play around with. The level design is also some of the best you could have in gaming. There are so many paths to take, and if you're willing to be creative, an almost infinite amount of ways to either sneak past your enemies or blast them apart if you so choose, and an amazing dark world that looks as if it's on the brink of collapse. The story kicks off with a bang too. You're with the Empress on the roof when, suddenly, you see these people approaching the both of you using some strange powers you've never seen before as they teleport from rooftop to rooftop. And before you know it, you're face to face with several assassins attempting to well, assassinate the Empress. You fend them off for a bit, but sadly, all your efforts are for naught, as you're forced to watch the woman you were sworn to protect die, her daughter kidnapped, and worst of all, you're blamed for all of it. Now, you're on a quest to track down Emily, as well as deal with the conspiracy of people who planned for the fall of the Empress. To say the first game was good would be an understatement. For many, it is THE quintessential stealth game. And yet, despite that, not many people seem to talk about the sequel which is a shame because it is, in my opinion, better than the original in almost every way. And to help facilitate my point, I'm going to try a bit of a different format for this video as I take you through my journey of Karnaka in this legendary stealth game. The game starts off with us playing as Emily, the daughter of the assassinated Empress and Corvo, royal protector and protagonist of the first game. The very first thing I noticed this game has over the original is that the protagonist, no matter which one you choose, is fully voiced. Not to say Corvo in the first game was egregious or awful or anything like that, but having a character with actual thoughts going on in their heads, with motives that we can truly understand, really does elevate the experience. Not to say either Corvo or Emily are amazing and fleshed out, but having a genuine character just helps me get attached to the story so much more. Also, to piggyback off that last point a little bit, yes, I said Corvo or Emily, because this time, we have a choice, and the choice you make does make a difference. Usually. Look, I'm doing New Game Plus for this playthrough, so I have access to all the powers, but 
for a brand new game, depending on who you pick, will decide what powers you have access to. Corvo has access to all the abilities he had in the first game, so you've got Blank, Bend Time, Dark Vision, Devouring Swarm, Possession, and Wind Blast, while Emily has access to her own special set, sharing only Dark Vision, but having a Domino, Doppelganger, Far Reach, Mesmerize, and Shadow Walk. To tell the truth, I didn't make use of many of Emily's abilities in this run, but that mostly has to do with how I wanted to play the game, namely a shadow clean hands run, or a run where I'm never spotted and never kill anybody, and Corvo's access to bend time and blink are the bread and butter for that sort of run, though Domino certainly got plenty of uses. With that out of the way, for this run I decided to play as Corvo, so as Delilah, a self-proclaimed sister to the late Empress, storms into the castle, she turns the character we choose not to play, in this case Emily, into stone, and before that, she takes away the mark of the outsider from Corvo, making us powerless to stop her. As we're knocked out, Delilah decides not to kill us, and instead has her lackey drag us off into an office, which is where I realize I am playing the game on low graphics setting like a fucking swine and fix that issue promptly. After which, we make our way out via the window, meeting Captain Mayweather in the hallway after her… unfortunate accident. We give her a brief rundown of everything before retrieving our sword and making our way to the treacherous Captain Ramsey. Managing to sneak behind him, we choke him out and take the ring he stole from us back, which also doubles as a key to the tower treasury. As we take Ramsey into the treasury, we make sure to lock him in, taking the only key to the room, our gun, and most importantly, our ever so iconic mask from the first game. On our way out, we're hit with the first major hurdle of the game, namely, a level we have to go through with no powers to use and abuse, while making sure we never get caught of course, never save scumming, we make our way to the Dreadful Whale, the main hub for the rest of the game, run by Megan Foster. After a restful sleep, we are woken up and greeted to a familiar friend and are given back our powers, which, thank goodness, some of these levels are rough without access to our powers. The first mission ends, and in my opinion, it starts off with a bang. Compared to the first game's opening, I find it's better, at least on a personal level. Regardless of who you choose as your protagonist, they feel like they actually have something to lose compared to the first game where you just feel like you're doing your job and trying to prove your innocence. Yes, retrospectively, the fact that it's revealed that Emily is your daughter sure adds some personal stakes to it, but you didn't know that when you started playing the game. It does a good job of teaching you the mechanics of the game without being too difficult or intrusive. It's certainly not as exciting as the prison escape of the first game, but I'd rather have personal stakes over explosive set pieces, personally. That aside, once we're rested up, we meet with Megan Foster as we make our way to Karnaka, which is a miracle when you consider our boat gets constantly flooded. As we make land, we instantly pull out the heart of our dead lover and are hit with the main content of this game, the runes and bone charms. See, we could easily go to the markers on the map, but doing that, you'll find that the game is incredibly short. Runes and Bone Charms serve much of the same purpose they served in the first game, namely, runes are used to unlock powers and upgrades, and Bone Charms give us certain abilities, things like uh, faster mana recharges, moving faster when holding a body, things of that nature. To trail off a bit, this game actually adds the ability to craft your own Bone Charms, depending on which charms you find and are willing to dismantle to learn their powers. Things can get very broken very quickly doing this, but I find it's nice to have a reward for going out of your way to do the stuff, and getting free time stops about 25% of the time is definitely rewarding. We make our way to the black market to help us better prepare for our mission when, on the way, we run into this hot chick who gives us a job to do. As a gentleman, I see a woman in need, and I, of course, am obliged to help. It turns out, 
She uh, needs help transporting a body and not asking any questions. I get to that immediately. Traveling through a blood of fly infested apartment. God help me, I hate these things. We find the corpse in a torture chamber ran by the most upstanding of citizens. As I deliver the body, Mindy informs me that she has one of her men turn off the power to the rails, making it easier for us to traverse along the city and sneak past guards from up above. We have one last stop, so we make our way to the safe store, choke the poor innocent clerk out, then rob him blind. Alright, now to the Meyer Institute. Overall, the second level is decently memorable. One thing you'll notice in this game, and some might consider it a downgrade, is that it's much brighter than the first game. The first game has this eerie feeling that everything is messed up and all is wrong with the world. There was a plague and rats were considered deadly. Entering a room with them had a level of fear to it. It. And while I find the blood flies fucking disgusting and I hate them, I can't say they invoke that same level of dread. They're just kind of annoying. All in all though, for the first real mission, we're off to a pretty good start. The level design gives us plenty of ways to tackle the main objectives with side quests opening up other avenues for us, or just having the option to go unga bunga, run past the guards, and go straight to the institute. As we get to Adermeyer in order to find Dr. Hypatia, we're instantly hit with some striking visuals. The Institute looks old and worn down. There's trash everywhere, and the only signs of life we see are from guards, not a single doctor or patient in sight. We can instantly tell something is wrong. Making our way through the Institute, we start to hear rumors from the guards. It seems there's a monster somewhere haunting these halls. We push this off as nothing more than superstition for the moment, but as we make our way to an abandoned wing, we find the corpse of a man who, according to the letter he was clutching, learned too much. We continue down, learning more as we go, more rumors, but... Along the way, we meet a man named Hamilton, a survivor of something. The man is freaking out, saying he wasn't just seeing things. There is something killing people here. We travel further into the Institute, knocking out guards, finding charms, and taking runes. Eventually, we find ourselves in the recuperation room, finding a bloodied, dying man. He tells us it's Dr. Hypatia herself, who is this rumored monster killing people, making them disappear, and even more shocking is the crown killer herself, a serial killer taking out several political opponents throughout the kingdom. With his dying breaths, Vesco tells us there's a cure for the good doctor and begs us to save her as she breaks in and demands to eat his flesh, sneaking past the crazy girl by, uh... We make our way to Vesco's shop, unlock his safe, make the cure, and then inject the cure on the doctor. As she regains her composure, we offer her a place aboard the whale before turning off the watchtower and getting the hell out of Dodge. Overall, I love the atmosphere of the Institute. I think it's up there with some of the best from the first game. I just think it's let down slightly by its level design. Not to say it's bad, far from it, everything just feels a little too compact, and it felt like the only level where I didn't really have a ton of options on how to approach the objectives how I wanted to. It still has its cool set pieces, like with Vesco bleeding out from the doctor, or the elevator crashing down revealing a flooded basement. But sadly, it is the weakest level the game has to offer, at least in my opinion. After we take a well-deserved nap, patching a hole, and paying the doctor a visit, we head off 
to the Aventa district. This time, our target is the grand inventor, Kirin Jendosh. Before that, though, we need supplies, so we make our way to the local black market. As we begin rizzing up the merchant, we hear our husband pull into the driveway. With no way to get out without getting caught, we come up with the genius idea to hide underneath the table. After a quick lover spat, Cause I like you. We buy our stuff and head out. As we start to take the roller coaster to the manor, we're hit with a minor roadblock. Namely, we don't have the password to actually get there. No big deal. We break into the local police station, find the sergeant passed out with the passcode conveniently placed underneath him, and make our way to the clockwork mansion. Now this, this is where the mission really starts, and it is one of the coolest goddamn levels ever. Not just in Dishonored, but in video games in general. As we enter the mansion, we are greeted by a switch. Pulling it, the house starts to move and shift. Chunks of the building are replaced by others. We can physically see everything change. And what's more, since this isn't a cutscene, if we are so inclined, we can even jump behind the walls as they move, letting us get into areas Jindosh had never intended for anyone to see. And to add on to that, this level also introduces my favorite enemy in the series, the Clockwork Soldiers. These killer machines help remedy one of my biggest issues with the first game, namely that they are a genuine threat. Even while abusing overpowered abilities like Time Stop, they're not pushovers. And that's assuming you're playing Corvo. Emily is going to have a much, much rougher time dealing with these guys. One of my biggest issues with the first game is that the reason you were hiding was because you wanted the good ending. If you didn't care about being caught or about which ending you got, there was nothing to stop you from going in guns blazing because there wasn't a single enemy in the game that was a genuine threat. You were protecting the bad guys from you. So to have an actual incentive to not get in a fight, even if it's relatively small, is a massive plus in my book for a stealth game. Instead of messing with the main gimmick of the house and flipping switches like a dumb rat in a Skinner box, we instead unga bunga caveman this and break the window, letting us sneak through the manor without any indication that we were ever even here. This makes the level much easier in my opinion, but sadly it does come with the cost of not getting the witty banter from Jindosh. But even with that stipulation, I love that the game lets you do this. It gives you this super cool level with so much thought and love put into it, with an amazing antagonist constantly berating you the entire time and just lets you skip all of that if you want. You aren't forced to experience any of it. If you're perceptive and resourceful, the game rewards you. After collecting the collectibles as a standard, we head off towards our target. Sneaking past guards and several offline machines, we find ourselves in the workshop of the madman himself. Abusing time stop, sorry, I'm a bit of a weenie, we manage to knock him out and blow up the two robot guards without anyone ever knowing we were here. And see, this is where one of the best parts of the level comes from. We gotta figure out a way to deal with this guy. That big brain of his? It's a problem. He's gonna use it to build more of these clockwork soldiers, or maybe invent something even worse, and we just can't have that. But what can we do? Killing him is out of the question because we're good Christian boys, so what's the other option? Well, looking around the lab, we find some some particular notes. We find a machine that Jindosh was experimenting with in hopes of making Sokolov, the genius inventor of the first game, comply. Apparently, he was hoping to change the way his brain works through electricity. Of course, the experiments weren't working, and it was found that, instead, the machine would only make the poor sod you throw into there a bumbling idiot. Hmm. 
Strapping Jindosh into his booster seat, we pull the lever and experience one of the most gruesome, non-lethal takedowns the series has to offer as we watch an unparalleled genius turn into... Uh... Please, kill me. Please, make me... Die. Now, this is something I've avoided talking about for a bit, but the non-lethal takedowns in the second game are honestly not nearly as memorable. Jindosh ends up being the exception to the rule as you basically fry his brain and turn the greatest mind of all time into your average Twitter user, and it's genuinely gruesome. I cannot imagine many fates worse than this. But the other takedowns in the game are far less brutal. In fact, in most of them, you're not even taking someone down. You're saving them. See, Hypatia. In contrast to the first game, I find those takedowns still stick with me, like kidnapping a woman and selling her off to her stalker, or having a couple of men kidnapped and forced to work slave labor after their tongues are cut out, or even how you brand a man with an iron for forcing him to a life of begging on the streets. In most cases, in the first game, I'd rather die than be put through what some of these saps are stuck with. I don't know why, but it feels like the second game pulls its punches here, again with the exception of Jindosh, the prick. Moving on, we aren't done quite yet. Having dispatched of Jindosh and getting the Steam achievement, which I already had so I don't know why I did this, we are free to pull the levers as much as we want now, and doing so, we make our way to the basement where we find an old friend who just instantly falls into a coma. Carrying him out, we make our way outside the manor and back to the dreadful whale where Megan is relieved to see Sokolov safe and sound, if a little worse for wear. Now, I think this kind of goes without saying, but I think this is one of the coolest levels in not just the game, but in stealth games in general. The whole concept of the level constantly changing and shifting with an antagonist that isn't scared to berate you and egg you on, it's super memorable. Memorable. Overall, I always look forward to this level whenever I play the game. As we go to sleep after a job well done, we find ourselves back in the void, but this time it wasn't the outsider who called us. No, no, no. Apparently, this is something Delilah can also do for some reason. It's never really explained why or how she became this powerful, nor does she ever really do anything with all this power, but that's spoilers. For now, she's using this power to give us her entire backstory, and to give you the too long didn't read, Delilah was born from the previous emperor, the father of Jessamine, having an affair with one of the kitchen maids. As a result, Delilah was technically royalty, but also kept hidden so as not to expose the Emperor for his crimes of adultery, though he always promised her that one day she'd be allowed to be a true princess like her sister. Then one day, as Jessamine and Delilah were playing, they break an artifact worth a priceless sum, and the blame is pinned entirely on Delilah. As a result, her and her mother are kicked onto the streets, begging for food and scrounging up whatever they can. As Delilah is forced to bear the brunt of this hardship, her mother gets sick and passes away. Understandably, she becomes resentful towards Jessamine and the entire system as a whole. Overall, I think Delilah's story is fine. I have no issues with it other than how it's presented. Like, I see what the devs are going for, giving us a villain with understandable motives motives, and even showing that people like Jessamine, the previous empress, aren't the perfect angels we were led to believe, that everyone has skeletons in their closet. I just don't like that Delilah interrupts us right after a mission to just dump all this on us. I feel like this would have been better if, for example, we saw a flashback but from Jessamine's perspective. Maybe the outsider shows us why Delilah is so bitter towards Emily and the family, or anything, but having Delilah interrupt us randomly just to bitch and moan about how bad her life was. Anyhow, sleeping done, we 
head out to get our mission debriefing with Sokolov and Megan. This time, we're after a rumored witch named Brianna Ashworth, curator of the Royal Conservatory. What does she do? Uh, witch stuff, I guess. I don't know, to be honest. That always seemed like Delilah's thing, but Brianna is there, I guess, and we're going to stop that. Making our way to our typical black market stop, we find a harrowing scene, and being the hero I am, I of course spring to help the young lady. After all, nobody can rob you if everyone is asleep. Making our way inside, the shopkeep gives us a job to find out what his associate was getting up to, and promises a reward for doing so. Agreeing to this, we head off, grabbing some doodads and thingamajigs along the way. As we reach the apartment of said associate, we find a letter saying he was after a prototype of some sort in the conservatory. Well, then that convenient. Making our way to the conservatory, we find the hallways overrun with these black, creepy vines, and overall, the place just looks like a dump. To tell you the truth, I love the atmosphere here. It feels creepy, dark. There's a mysterious aura in this place, and I genuinely adore it. We're also introduced to the last two enemy types in the game here, that being witches, who can perform basic magics, but nothing compared to what we can do and ghost hounds, who need to be killed twice to die for good. Not as threatening as the clockwork soldiers, certainly, but the witches I find are nice in that, namely, they'll be in hard to reach places, like sitting on top of a bookshelf, meaning you need to be even more aware of your surroundings if you want to sneak by undetected. As we clear out the conservatory, we find our prototype, making sure to deal with the security all stealthy-like. Now to deal with Brianna. Doing some digging around, we find out that she gets her powers from some strange machine that Jindosh built. We also learn that it works through some strange combinations of lenses and electricity and that Brianna for some reason, keeps spare, defective lenses around. So, we go pick those up and slap them into the machine, instantly making Brianna powerless and effectively neutralized. Of course, that doesn't stop us from knocking her out and robbing her blind. Target taken down and prototype secured, we make our way to the black market to turn in our side quest before going back to the dreadful whale with another job well done. Overall, the fifth mission is a pretty Pretty darn good one. The level design is top notch, as to be expected. The atmosphere, while not reaching the highs of the first game or even of Adermeyer, it's still good in its own right, and the introduction of two new enemy types that can be genuinely threatening, or at the very least annoying, I suppose, does help breathe some life into the game. While the villain is forgettable, and her elimination is a bit anti-dramatic, the level itself is still very fun to play through. Waking up, we find that Dr. Hypatia is gone, along with Megan. This time, it seems we're being briefed by Sokolov alone, who tells us we need to figure out what happened at Aramis Stilton's house that made Delilah immortal. Problem is, nobody has heard from Stilton in years. So off to the Dust District we go in an attempt to see if we can solve this mystery. As we head off, Sokolov lets us know that Megan had left ahead of us in order to scout out the place, and we should meet up to go over whatever intel she managed to gather. As we land and make our way out of the tunnel, it doesn't take long before we learn why this place is called the Dust District. This is the main gimmick of the level, and honestly, it's fairly interesting. It's annoying, makes things difficult to see, but if we're clever, we can use it to our advantage. Meeting up with Megan, she gives us the rundown of what's happening. Basically, the Dust District is split between two factions, the Howlers, run by Palo, because I like you 
and the Overseers, currently led by Vice Overseer Liam Byrne. Megan tells us that we can side with either group to take out the leader of the other, and in turn, that faction will help us get into Stilton's home. Stopping by the Howler's territory first, we take a look at a note left on one of the locked doors, where we learn that there might be another way. See, the code we need is in that room, and the key, well, we just learned that the Vice Overseer has it. Now, we could take out Paolo and hand deliver him to the Vice Overseer, or we can decide we don't like either faction and be content to let them kill each other which is what I go for. Sneaking over to the Overseer hideout, we find ourselves above the Vice Overseer himself giving a lecture to his subordinates, but we're not here for him, so we take out everyone in the room, non-lethally of course, and decide to just take the key. Sneaking back out, we make our way back to Palo's domain and ignoring him and his goons entirely, we break into the once locked room and get our prize, the door passcode. And now, this is such a super cool part of the level. As we make our way to Stilton's home, we see it's a riddle to open the door into his manor. And there's so many ways to get this code. You can side with either faction, neither, or if you've got a big enough brain, or Google, I guess, you could just solve the riddle, bypassing the entire level. I love that the devs truly meant it when they said, play your way. And I don't think there's a better example than this mission, but the best is yet to come. As we enter the door with our legitimately acquired passcode, we're greeted to the site of what appears to be an abandoned manor, and already we can tell something is off. Any attempt to use our powers fail. No blink, no time stop, no domino. But so far, that doesn't seem like a problem. After all, the place is abandoned. There's nothing to hide from. Yet, it doesn't help the uneasy feeling here. It just feels unnatural. As we go deeper into the mansion, we find it's not as abandoned as we thought. In fact, we find ourselves face to face with Aramis Stilton himself, though sadly it doesn't seem like we'll be getting much out of him as he's a raving madman. Seemingly out of options, the outsider appears and instead of giving us answers, he does something much, much better. He gives us the ability to find our own answers. He refers to this artifact as a timepiece, and using it for the first time, we find ourselves in the same manner, but it's cleaner, it's brighter, and most of all, it's full of life. There are guards walking around, servants doing tasks, and it's here we realize we just gained the ability to travel into the past, to the night where Aramis lost his mind. And this is one of the coolest mechanics I've ever played with. Going back and forth in time to unlock doors, bypass debris, sneak past guards who are no longer there in the future, setting up puzzle pieces in the past to take advantage of in the present. It is genuinely my favorite level, not just in the sequel, but in the series. I think the only thing holding it back is that we can't use our powers here, but in a way that adds to the charm. That means whether you're doing a flesh and steel run or just your normal anything goes power run, your experience here is going to be relatively the same. I honestly cannot get over how cool this level is. I remember the first time playing through it and it just blew my mind. Even now, I get giddy whenever I just think about playing through this area again. As for our mission, well, we're here to figure out what made Delilah immortal. And since talking to Stilton is out of the question, we need to do some recon. And with Recon out of the way, we take a stop at the backyard where we see Stilton pacing back and forth nervously. Deciding it'd be best if he wasn't awake, we knock him out and steal the super secret passcode from his journal. And now this? This is where the level goes from great to 
the best. Our actions in the past have had relatively minor consequences in the future until this moment. By making sure Stilton wasn't awake to witness whatever it is he did, we altered the timeline permanently. As we travel back to the present, we can instantly tell the difference. The house is no longer a dump. Servants are going about doing their jobs. People are talking about how great of a guy Stilton is. Everything has changed, and for the better. It's such an amazing moment, and one where you truly feel like the choices you make matter. We could have been on the low chaos route still, but chosen not to render Aramis unconscious and, therefore, leaving the present as is. And the fact the game doesn't force us to knock him out, or even tell us it's an option, it's just something we can do if we choose, I think makes this moment feel so, so earned. Making our way to the secret hideout and entering the passcode, we find ourselves in the strangest area yet. Time in the mansion has always been distorted, but here it's almost collapsing in on itself, yet somehow remaining stable. We don't know if we're in the past, the present, or some weird combination of both. Now, there's nothing to really do here other than watch the gang get together and put their evil plan into action, which I think is a shame. We could have had some unique enemies or challenges specifically to this area, maybe guards or servants that are trapped in two time periods at the same time, having gone mad by being forced to exist in two places at once, or some sort of creature that managed to crawl its way out of the void thanks to the rift in here, or just anything. It's not a big deal, it's just a little disappointing is all. Anyhow, listening in, we watch as Delilah turns herself immortal. How? She basically Harry Potters that shit, I think. I never read Harry Potter. She takes a part of her soul and locks it away in this strange statue of herself, and this, in turn, makes her unable to die. I'm not sure I understand the logic behind it, but it's creepy witch shit, so let's not question it. It's also while watching this we discover the Duke of Sirkonos, Luca Abel, has been trusted with safeguarding this piece of Delilah's soul in order to keep her forever immortal. Just before we make our way out, Delilah lets us know she knows we're here watching her and even knows when we are and that she will crush us, which makes her decision to let us live at the beginning of the game even more baffling. Mission complete with a nice side of saving the nicest rich person to ever live, we make our way out of the mansion and back to the dust district, but not before the outsider has a small chat with us basically telling us that our actions have forever changed the landscape of the world, or whatever. As we re-enter the Dust District, we can instantly see the changes our actions have brought. Dust storms are a thing of the past. There are people just out and about talking, laughing, living their lives. The constant turf wars between the Howlers and the Overseers isn't even a thing of the past. It never happened to begin with now. And most surprisingly of all, we see Megan now has her arm and eye back with not even a scar in sight. And can I just say, I love this moment. I love it because Corvo and Emily never comment on it. The writers respect their character's intelligence and, in turn, our intelligence, enough to just let us connect the dots ourselves. In most other stories, there would have been a scene where the protagonist would see Megan has her arm and eye and say something along the lines of, Megan, you have your arm? Uh, yeah? Are you okay? Oh my god, my actions in the past changed it to where she never lost her arm. Basically just spelling it out for us. It's just nice to have a story that doesn't spoon feed me everything for once. Thank you, Arcane. I genuinely appreciate that little touch. Back on the ship, we wake up to find Aramis Stilton is now a part of our little escapade, and again, I love that Corvo, or Emily if you're playing as her, doesn't commentate on that fact. Aramis seemed like a good man, and I can buy that he'd be helping us out now. Anywho, we're told that we're invading Luca a 
Belle's home now, a massive gaudy palace. Because if there's anywhere he'd keep Delilah's soul, it'd be there. As we take off with Megan, she informs us that Luca Abel has a body double in hopes of confusing would-be assassins. She also lets us know that the body double is a smoker, so okay, we have our target. We make our way out and can't go straight to the palace. Security is just too tight, so we stop at the nearby city. It is also at this point in the game that I decide my current build is good enough and now elect to entirely skip out on runes and bone charms. And boy howdy, does the game get so much shorter when you just go straight to the objectives. My typical playtime for a level was around two hours. For these last two levels, about 30 minutes each. I don't think it's a bad thing. After all, I'm abusing powerful abilities and actively choosing to skip content. It'd be a bad thing if it was still taking me two plus hours to complete a level. Moving on, we zoom past all the side quests and go straight to the quirky rich person roller coaster going straight to the Duke's palace. Sneaking around, we see his guards are living it up good, paid more than any other guard, and it looks as if they just get high and sit around all day, living their best life. Of course, there are competent enemies here, namely the clockwork soldiers, and they're just as dangerous as they were earlier. Sneaking past, we begin spying on one of the dukes, and BAM, he's a smoker. Approaching him, we claim he's the double and ask him if he would like to pull an epic prank on the real Duke. He agrees to the idea, but literally in the middle of this cutscene, one of the robots walks into the room and, uh... <laughs> Anyhow, speaking to him, we learn we need to bring the Duke to his quarters and the body double will handle the rest. After we put the Duke to bed, we go and hide in a nearby flower pot and watch as the body double goes through with his epic YouTube prank. Oh baby, I can feel the views coming in now. First part of the plan now finished, we now need to make our way to the vault and steal back Delilah's soul. Outside the vault, we see an arc pylon. The these things are nasty. It's basically a bug zapper, but for humans, and it has range. It also doesn't help that a clockwork soldier is patrolling nearby, but using my big gamer brain, I come up with a plan to handle both. Back in Luca Abel's room, I grab an empty bottle, and quickly running to the vault door, I stop time and manage to place a rewire tool on the arc pylon, making it work for us and instead electrocuting anyone else who happens to step into range. And finally, I blink back to the roof and throw the glass into the room, alerting the clockwork soldier. And to my surprise, my plan works perfectly. As the robot walks in, I hear only a short zap before looking in and seeing only scraps of metal of what used to be a formidable foe. Inside the vault, we see the walls lined with enough gold to buy out XQC to your streaming service of choice and another clockwork soldier patrolling around. This one is much easier to deal with since it's alone, so I have no qualms of just rewiring it. Hey, I only have to not kill while on the mission. If somebody walks in after I'm already gone and gets their head cut off, that's not my problem. After the robot is our new BFF, we find the weird wax thing of Delilah and sadly have to say goodbye to our wife so our new girl can move into her old place. With Delilah's soul in hand and the Duke handled, we head off to rejoin with Megan for our last trip on the dreadful whale. I'm gonna miss this girl. Overall, this was a great mission. I love the non-lethal way you take down the Duke here. It's not brutal, no, but I think it's very appropriate. The man very much led to his own downfall. Nobody was loyal to him, and the second someone had the chance to stab him in the back and take over, there wasn't even a moment of hesitation. It is also, in my opinion, one of the most challenging levels when you're going for all the runes and bone charms. But uh, we didn't do that this time, so it was pretty easy. 
Waking up, we begin prepping for the final day, by which I mean I sneak up on Megan, steal her key, then rob her blind, after which we have a conversation. The first thing she tells us is that her name isn't actually Megan, that was just an alias. Instead, her name is actually Billy, which is a stupid name, can you imagine? And that she was partially responsible for what happened that day during Jessamine's assassination, as she had an extremely close relationship with Dao. In fact, she was his right-hand man. Since then, she's come to regret it, and while Corvo slash Emily don't forgive her for what she did, we also decide to not harp on her for it. So for this last ride, we take the skiff ourselves and head back to the place where it all started. Dunwall. Making our way to the familiar city, we see that the place has come to ruin. Bodies litter the streets, there's blood and debris everywhere we look, and even a few ghost towns hunting for any stragglers. Any survivors are currently locked in their homes, with only the truly brave or truly desperate, daring to leave what little safety their houses can provide. We also hear the constant singing from what appears to be an announcement system. Things are looking bleak, but we're here to solve that. Going back the way we came originally, we climb the roofs of Dunwall, making our way to the secret entrance we used oh so long ago. Waiting for us is the ever so prolific singer casting her voice throughout the city. Of course, we're not big fans, so we give her the old reliable and give the citizens of Dunwall a rousing speech. I come to make an announcement, shout the hedgehogs out. Business finished, we make our way to Dunwall Tower. Unfortunately, the old escape route we used has been blocked off. Seems Delilah was being wary of someone using them to get to her. Sadly, this means we'll have to enter the tower from the bottom. Sneaking in via a drain, we make our way inside and, uh, whoo! boy, this place has definitely seen better days. Looking around, we learn that our target is in the throne room, and that she has cut off all electricity in the building so nobody can use the elevator to get to her. Heading down to the basement, past a few witches and a clockwork soldier or two, we find ourselves in the power room. Filling up an empty tank with some whale juice, we place it into this doohickey and pull that whatchamacallit, and uh, boom! We got power or something. Knocking out the OSHA inspectors on their way to see our job site, we head back upstairs and to the elevator, climbing up and making our way across the roof. We find ourselves in front of the throne roof, breaking down the wooden boards blocking it. This somehow does not alert Delilah to our presence. We use this opportunity to place a corrupted rune we had crafted earlier in the tower onto the throne so as to make sure she is never a problem again once our plan comes to fruition. Using the fact that she is deaf to our advantage, we sneak up behind Delilah and forcefully jam her soul back into her. Once Delilah has come to terms with the fact that she is once again mortal, she retreats into her painted world. Following after her, we're by a white void and stone statues of people with Delilah sitting on a throne waiting for us. Now, there's two ways to handle this final boss. The first way is the dumb, stupid, idiot way. We can charge at her, where after she uses her shadow clone jutsu and we now have to try and pick out the real one among the fakes, and this goes about as well as you would imagine. Or you could do this the cool, smart, gamer way. Once Delilah is taken out, by whatever means, we return to the real world with her in hand. By placing her on the throne, we manage to trap her in her own painted world for good as a result of the corrupted rune. Once she's dealt with, we save Emily from her stone prison, and it's happily ever after for everyone except Billy, as we're given a bit of a teaser for the next Dishonored title. Overall, I love Dishonored too. Yeah, it's 
it stumbles in places, and sure, the atmosphere doesn't quite live up to the first game, but from a gameplay perspective, I think the sequel does everything better. More powers to play around with, some of the most interesting level designs in any stealth game ever, unique mechanics, enemies that are genuine threats, and the best final boss I've ever seen in a stealth game. Not even joking on that. From beginning to end, the game rewards you for taking your time, scoping things out. Chances are, if you're struggling with an objective, there's probably an easier route to take if you just paid attention or tried going to it from a different angle. There is no shortage of interesting NPCs, and the choices you make, despite how linear the game is, do feel like they have genuine consequences. It honestly breaks my heart that this game didn't sell nearly as well as the first because it has just as much heart as the first game, even if it's rough in some places. Before someone brings it up, I am aware that part of the reason for the poor sales of Dishonored 2 was the terrible launch on PC. When this game came out, even top-end PCs at the time couldn't get a stable 60 FPS, and that was on top of numerous bugs and constant crashing. It was inexcusable to be sure. But even these days, when all of that has been fixed, nobody really talks about it. And a part of me thinks that's just because stealth games are sadly not that popular. Stealth isn't a genre that appeals to a lot of people. It requires patience, planning, waiting, things that a lot of people don't find very fun. And I get it. I'm not ragging on anyone for it. I love going full action man in games. Guns blazing, killing everything in sight, blowing people up. It's fun, and it's a lot easier to understand. But to me, there really is nothing like pulling off the perfect heist making all the pieces fall in place and make it seem as if you were never there to begin with. With the series now on an indefinite hiatus due to the poor sales of both this game and Death of the Outsider, who knows if Arcane Studios will ever make another Dishonored game. But one thing's for sure though, I will always love this game. It, to me, is everything a sequel should be. It improved what the first game did in almost every department, even if it stumbled in a few places. Hey, if you made it to this part of the video, genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I understand it was long, but if you enjoy this sort of content, I want to know down in the comments. Did you like it? Is this the sort of content you want to see from me? You know, what could be better, what could be worse? And while we're on that subject, I do also want to address uh, some things you probably noticed throughout the video. The first obvious thing you probably noticed is the video quality of the game footage. I'm not going to make excuses for myself. That was purely me being stupid and not testing out OBS before I went and recorded the entire 12 hour game. The other thing you will probably have noticed if you got this far is that towards the end of the video, the audio quality dipped pretty bad. And that had to do with me basically reading the entire script. There was a script, I know, but reading the entire script in one setting rather than getting about halfway through, taking a break, etc, etc. And this video did take longer to get out than uh, every other video, and for that I do genuinely apologize. It should not have taken me that long. I had to learn some new things, I had to learn how to edit better, and this video did teach me that, and hopefully I will take those skills into future videos and future projects. But I do genuinely want to know down in the comments, DMs on Twitter, wherever you want to tell me, you can tell me in my Discord if you want, if this is the sort of content that you would like to see in the future where I try to get uh, really deep into a game during a playthrough. I enjoyed the experience. It was a very fun experience to make. I absolutely enjoyed learning more about the editing software that I use, and I just enjoyed playing a game and looking at it a bit more critically, understanding why I like the things that I do. And I just want to know if that's the sort of thing you want to see more of. And if you don't, if you want to go back to the previous video styles and the much shorter, much easier to produce content, I'm more than happy to go back to that as well. But I, I want to know what everyone thinks. If you haven't already, you know, like, comment, subscribe, all of that. Uh, it does help out the channel. It does help out me. We are trying to hit partner by the end of the year. That would be amazing. All right. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next video.